what is happening people we are live let me just check that we've got our audio all set everything's looking nice yes we are looking good what's happening everyone we are live for episode 71 of the end product podcast as always i'm here with my sparring partner quinny how you doing sir very good stashy boy how are you i'm good mate i am decent got a little weekend in amsterdam ahead big amsterdam dance event happening out there so busy busy period for people in my line of work uh so yeah looking forward to that um actually gigging um for a promoter out there who i met in antwerp earlier this year and we spent most of the evening talking about fire nord who is his club so um yeah looking forward to catching up with him on on all things fire nord and yeah we'll be able to talk about what happened uh, like so they won the league since uh since we last met so uh, yeah he's actually picked up a a, like a rare football shirt for me so we're going to do a little handover so looking forward to that next week on the podcast i might have some some fresh garms on for you so um yeah looking forward to that what about yourself what's going on in the in, in your world quinny oh but just about getting through the wilderness of this international break that's just been it's like getting through the desert that's what it's felt like you know in that sense you know you see the mirage coming you think oh maybe is it is it this weekend oh no it's not that weekend and then Oh, we can set teams. Oh no, there's a midweek, and then but we're here now. It's not my mirage. We can see paradise is nigh. We're almost there, uh, kind of thing. So, uh, in terms of football, that's kind of been the main thing for me. We've got Celtic 3D cards on the platform now as well, and already huge props, huge shout out early on in the podcast. I think Bride Ace has been out and scooped up a lot of number ones. I think, and uh, he's shot himself up to five percent already number one collector on 3d what um by a long stretch you know so uh good to see the scottish cards are on good to see some 3d hoops in action and uh yeah good to see we're past the international break although it was very good for scotland qualifying officially for the euros with uh, spain doing the business against norway for us even though we didn't do the job against spain we're qualified we're booking tickets for germany we're going uh, even though we don't know what group we're in you know my mates were all sending me links to tickets I was like, oh, Brian, cool. And then you open it up, and it's like the only team that you know where they are is Germany. So it just says Germany and TBD everywhere else. So you've got no idea what you're trying to like put yourself against. You know, you're putting yourself against pot B and D and stuff like that in different oh. groups, and it's blind. So apparently, a lot of Scots are aiming for Cologne, I think, or um, is it Cologne? I think it is Cologne. I think that's where a lot of the Scots are aiming for anyway. So yeah, uh, we'll see how it all pans out. But yeah. That's kind of me. Do you reckon you'll get out there, Quinny? You're going to buy tickets? I would really want to, for sure. But um, it's uh, hard to it's hard to it's hard to put your name down for tickets and commit to going to a city and all that. And then it's like, oh, it's not even here. Great, <laughs> you know. And we're going yeah. to see the Czech Republic versus France. Fantastic, or something, you know. And it's not quite the you know you want to go with the tartan art, you know, for me anyway. You want to go with the, the support. You want to go with the crowd. You want to go for the matches, see the moments, be a part of it. So yeah. if I can secure that, then I'm all about it. But yeah, we'll see how it comes. I've got myself uh, some tickets to go and watch England play um, against Malta next month. Oh, nice. And a, a part of the view to that was if I did want to go to Germany, then, you know, if you've bought tickets in the past and you're kind of like you're, you're in the market for tickets, it's a bit easier to get them once, you know, they go on sale for the actual finals competition. So who knows? I might might treat myself to a little trip to Germany. Um, but yeah, been a pretty good week um, all round, really, for the Brits, hasn't it? Because England qualified as well. Scotland, Wales looking uh, are on the up, but um, yeah, elsewhere it's not been so not been so great for for the for the Irish contingent. For any of you listening, unfortunately. But um, someone in the chat, Glenn Hoddle. Uh, Good to good to have you on board. Good to have a few uh, new names in the chat as well, Quinny. We've got Jordan UKZ so rare. That's something that he's saying that he's he loves the show every week, and you know he's a, a rare opportunity to join live. So uh, yeah, it's good to have you in the chat. And um, we've got Glenn Hoddle in the chat asking um, if any of us are going to be going to the states for the 2026 World Cup. I think if England qualify, or to be fair, even if they don't, I think I'd love to get out there. Um, USA 94 was one of the first tournaments that I watched 
like religiously as a child in terms of like football finals. I would have been like 11. And I remember coming home from school and whacking Eurosport on because all the games were on Eurosport back then. Um, we didn't have like the kind of fight for the rights um, that we probably see now. But um, I remember the really dry commentary on Eurosport, um, watching the goals, the highlights, like throughout the adverts on U Eurosport. It was always like the top five goals so far, blah, blah, blah. And it would be update day by day. Um, so, yeah, I think like I'd love to get out to America for the 2026 World Cup, even just to go on a bit of a like a driving tour, hitting up all the good barbecue spots en route. So, uh, yeah, yeah, put a pin in their diary for that one. Fingers crossed. That's dish versus food on Route 66. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be amazing. <laughs> that would be absolutely amazing. I like the idea of that. I might nick that one. I might put that in the put that in sure the diary for a couple of years. Go for mm. it. No, I definitely would see myself going there, you know, just thinking about it. Like, see, because Messi is in America at the moment, and this World Cup, I think it's probably going to have the most amount of teams in it spread across USA, Canada, Mexico. You know, technically, I think the majority of it is in America, you know, but um, so I think this work, you know, that the World Cup that you know, we we're just kind of briefly talking about there, I think it could be like a proper like festival, like a real, yeah. like real proper world, uh, because Qatar was a a bit different. Russia was a bit different. And I mean, it's in Europe, it's in Europe and whatever, you know, but America's kind of, especially with the way everything's kind of turning over there, the way with MLS, Beckham getting his week in a fifth media life or whatever he is, he's yeah. too messy over there and everything else. So, yeah, I think it'll be a great party that everyone will want to be involved in. So any teams that qualify, yeah, I'll, yeah, try and get there for sure, man. Be interesting to see if they kind of bring the whole like American football experience to the World Cup there with the tailgate parties and stuff in the car parks outside the stadiums. That was uh, cool. I went, uh, Glenn Hoddle's in the chat now saying that he lives in Kansas City. And I, when I was out there, I think it was the last time or a recent time, um, I got to go and watch the Chiefs in the stadium there. It's like the the record holder for the loudest stadium in the world. Um, nice. And yeah, outside the stadium was as much of an experience as being inside it was, to be honest, with all the stuff going on in the car park and the sort of 10, 20 minute walk up towards the stadium, just people parked up, music playing, coolers full of full of beers, like open up, you know, people barbecuing in the car parks. It was crazy. Like, yeah, it'd be amazing. Uh, Glenn Hoddle, if you're in Kansas City, you got to be hitting up Q39. I think I've shouted them out on this before. But uh, yeah, Q39's got to be up there. Go and have the wings in the starters there. But uh, this isn't a barbecue podcast, funnily enough, Quinny. Uh, <laughs> any end product to talk about? In the last week since we since we spoke, did you hit anything decent in the rewards? I don't think so. Um no, internationals, it's been dead as a dodo for me. I got a four-man threshold, but that was uh, that was as good as it got uh, on rare, which, you know, I take that over the international break, hitting that once, like, cool, that's fine. Like, yeah, that'll do me, mm. and I'll move on. And with the proceeds, um, it's not quite in shot for the podcast, but normally you'll be able to see like, there's a Fiorentina top just behind me on a mannequin, and uh, that's signed by Lucas Martinez Quatra, and he's been a guy that... He's been on the platform for a while. He's always been really overpriced because he's always had like a really deadly L10 and then he'll like disappear for a while. And then he'll come back and he'll have a really, really good streak of games. And they were always sold in bundles and he didn't get that many cards issued. So his price was always like mad inflated. Um, so with my four-man freshie, I needed a champ rare mid for this game week, maybe. Just with Robbo doing his shoulder uh, mm. and... Somebody else was a wee bit dicey, and I thought I could do with a wee bit of cover there just to make sure. Um, and I thought, well, why not go and get a wee Lucas Martinez Quatra? So I went and picked him up in 3D, which is good fun as well. Um, so unfortunately, they don't have a Fiorentina kit in that kit. On oh, right. yeah. So I can't see. really can he hit that strike. So I thought I'll get the 3D one, keep it in season, make some memories with it, you know, maybe try and watch a few more Fiorentina now that I've got the card. Because it's always been hard to, you need the card, you know what I mean? <laughs> like that yeah i i managed to i managed to scrape it was a weird one i think i messaged you in the week where i was sat really high in all-star rare pro or rare plus as it's called now we should get our thinking caps on uh rare plus as it's now called so i managed to hit a score that at the time i think was about 440 points or something like that um so i was sat in third place for a little while with you know like a day or two's fixtures left 
I was a little bit aware of the fact that some clubs or international teams had a second fixture that game week. And in case of teams like Netherlands, um, that was a slightly more favourable fixture than their first one against uh, France. I think they were playing Greece. So I was a little bit wary that, you know, like a few Dutch players could see a little bump in their scores. Um, but in the end, it was completely unawares to me, actually, that there was the Portugal fixture coming up and they absolutely romped it. You know, nearly every player in the team scoring a 70 plus. So where in the week it was like, I'm in third place, maybe looking at, at worst, getting knocked out to like eighth, ninth, um, which I wasn't too worried about because in terms of like the ETH prize in that place, it was like the difference between like, I was already kind of accepting of the fact that I'm probably not going to finish in that top four for a star. But if I can stay in that top 10, I'm going to get a tier one and I'm going to get the same amount of ETH whether I finish four, four, 10th. So I was like, sweet, lock that in. And then obviously we got this second round of fixtures and Szymanski had a little bit of an adjustment on his Opta scoring. So he lost a few points. So I saw myself knocked into fourth before the fixtures even started. And then in the end, I managed to finish as far down as 24th. So I got absolutely pummeled all the way into the tier wow. twos. Um, and not even near the top of the tier twos. I'm talking like I'm landing in the middle of that tier two pile, um, but did manage to hold on to a little ETH 0.064. Um, got my threshold as well, my cap, my rare threshold. Um, and I did actually manage to scrape another $5 threshold in Academy as well. So in terms of the cash return, I was happy with that. Got a tier two. And I know you and I were joking with Tony in the group chat. I was like, lads, at the time, we were joking about me landing in the tier ones or stars and being like, I'm definitely going to win a goalkeeper again. So I got knocked down into tier twos and you think there can't be many goalkeepers in there. I didn't really look at what was in the pool. And of course, what happens? Pulled another goalkeeper, didn't I? And not not just any goalkeeper, another below average uh, champ Euro goalkeeper, which I'm inundated with at the minute. I've got too many champ Euro goalkeepers that maybe came up from division two. So I lost a couple of Division Two options. They turned into like below average uh, champ options. So I'm actually like, I've got about five champ Euro goalkeeper options. Last The last reward I had before that was the uh, uh, Sven Ulreich, who is the sort of backup goalie at Bayern, who obviously is on his way out. I think Neuer's expected back in, possibly even this weekend. So I, man I, I actually sold him in the end for like 40 quid, like, I was just desperate to get rid of him. I had a couple of offers better than it, but I was expecting to get more than I did. And then it was like the, the offers were not coming in very fast anymore. Then it was just like an offer of like 40 quid came in. And I was like, Do you know, if I don't take this and I wait until the weekend and Neuer goes in, I'm looking at 20 at best for him probably because he might never play another minute again unless Neuer hits another bad injury. So I just took it 44 pounds or something like that, just kind of treated it like a threshold win. But uh, yeah, another goalkeeper. In this case, it was Silvestri, Udinese goalkeeper. Um, I do have uh, Maduka Okoye, who is the backup there. So the only good thing is that I've got a bit of a handcuff situation there. But I have listed him. Um, the only offers I've had for him have been like people trying to swap multiple cards. Um, I had to turn that off. So I was only accepting cash. And then I had uh, someone come in um, in the week after my Grimaldo 3D card. And I, I'm unlike you, I know you're a big fan of the 3D cards. I'm not so bothered. Like, they're nice. I like them. But um, he offered to swap his Benfica Grimaldo card for my 3D Leverkusen card. And his card had 8% XP, so it had more XP than mine. My Grimaldo for this season is the only Leverkusen card from this season I've got, so it's not... It's not making, you know, I'm not anywhere closer to that kind of like collection bonus, so to speak. Whereas he had like a lot of this season's cards. And I was trying to, I was I was looking at the difference. I was trying to see if I could get like a 0.1 ETH plus swap. Um, because at the time, a lot of his 3D cards were going for quite a lot. But I said, let's, yeah. there's a fit. I said, there's a, a you know, a auction coming up. Uh, maybe, you know, you can maybe try and win that because I weren't trying to let go of it cheaply. And there's quite a big gap between his this season's and last season's cards. I guess a lot of people are after the Leverkusen this season because they're in such good form. Um, but yeah, this collector was keen. Um, the reward went, sorry, the auction went for 
about 0.05 more than some of his like older cards are going for on the market. So yeah, we decided to make a deal there and I'm quite happy with it. Made managed to get another bit of cash in the bank. So all in, I think in terms of end product, I was quite happy with that for an international break. I know it, um, it's not the most exciting card reward. Definitely would have liked an outfielder just because it's a bit more exciting. But as we've said before, you know, having a goalkeeper that you want to list, you're more likely to be able to sell a goalkeeper. So if I just want to make some cash, Silvestri's there, you know, he's a 200 quid plus card. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy I'll take that all day long in international break. But like you, very much looking forward to getting back to some normality in uh, so rare terms this weekend. Quinny, got to have your eye on those so rare, so rare uh, Celtic 3D cards for this season. Has that impacted your thinking in the way that you are going to target the next few weeks mm -hmm. now those cards are in the pool? Well, I think this comes into the main question of the game week because every game week when we're looking at this, we're trying to think, you know, where is the end product? Where is the strategy for this week? Or even this kind of section of the season? Um, you know, there's different things we're always looking at. Powerhouse kind of fixtures or different elements of the game that are, are, are going on. And I think the big one, and if you're listening to this on Spotify, there should be a little poll thing, right? And we're really interested on you dropping a wee vote on that and then we'll check back on it again. And, you know, so get involved in that if you're on Spotify or, or whatever. But will, so the question will be something to the effect of, will you be trying in cap 270 this game week? Because for where, and you can answer that, everyone answers it for the scarcity that, you know, like if you won in it, you would be really excited about not, like the one that you don't care about as much, you know? So wherever that is to you, that's the, the frame of mind we want you in. Are you going to try uh, this game week? So I think for most people, Stish, um, that's the main kind of like maybe subprime decision for a lot of people. A lot of people probably still like, oh, the under 23 guys are taking care of themselves or the champ Euro guys are still going to do their thing. And it's the bits and pieces or it's the fun play or it's the hunch play, you know, mm. will people be trying for that? So. I think that's a big dynamic that's kind of going on in a lot and all the scarcities, of course, to different degrees and in different elements. So that, uh, so I want to win also those Celtic cards. I can see they're in the pool. I've went and found where they are and I'm going to go and try and get them this game week, which is good fun. Uh, so I, I am, yes. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe that main decision that everyone else is facing maybe clears my path ever so slightly. I don't think Challenger Super Rare, for example, is going to be uh, a hotly contested division amongst people that would be playing with super rare goalkeepers and such, you know. So true. Um, so yeah, it's kind of swayed my decision certainly in terms of I'm not. It's kind of made it easier for me to take my eye off that whole two seventy conundrum and think, well, I actually just know I can go and do this right now. So let <laughs> me just go and do that. But for how much, like I don't, I don't want to say flack, right? But for how much people downplayed the monthly 270 when it was presented the super cap i hear a lot of people saying that they're going to try you know mm. uh, you know not sure everyone's making it the number one pick for their teams but i hear a lot of people saying do you know what believe it or not i'm going to try <laughs> yeah. you know a lot of people are going for it yeah i mean i i had a little look at it so i think last week we spoke about it on a podcast and i thought and i think my that still holds quite true but i think that like after Last week, we were talking about, well, will I go for it? And I thought I'd go for it so long as the first couple of weeks go really well. And then it makes sense to continue to try and get that four banging scores across the next few weeks. Um, but I spent this week kind of already having a look ahead at what what I have available um, in those midweeks and stuff like that. Like, is, am I going to be able to put anything out in those midweeks as well? We've got like seven, eight game weeks or whatever. Um, how many of those am I likely to be able to field a full team in? Because obviously in the midweek, sometimes there's like lesser fixtures um, or the rotation suggests that my it's going to be hard to pick a team. So for me, my cap 270 super rare for this weekend coming looked like a strong option. Um, probably more strong than putting it in All-Star because I don't at the moment have a unique that I can rely on being a player, scoring a big score. I'm waiting for like Levitt to get himself back into that starting lineup. And, you know, I think only time will tell with Lee Hambom at Michelin. He's back now from international duty, um, doing winning the Asian Games, which was nice because 
as a Lehan bomb owner means that he won't do any military service now. So that's great. Um, but now we just need to wait and see if he's going to become a starter in Denmark. So, um, yeah, I've got a little bit of waiting to do, I think, before like all star super air becomes a real heavy option for me. I, I, I love the option or the idea of having a super uh, a unique in in there. So I have been looking recently pre this 270 cap in super rare is actually something that I've put strong lineups in recently, but I just haven't hit the scores that I needed to hit. Um, you know, players let me down or someone didn't start or the captain didn't hit heavy. You always want the captain to smash and then you're in with a big shout, right? So this week I've got a very strong team in super rare, but because it was super rare, I really felt like I needed to look ahead because, yeah, I've got a great team this week. But if next week I haven't got a goalkeeper playing or I haven't got, then, you know, like targeting that now makes very little sense. So, yeah, I wonder if anyone else has thought that far ahead. The fact that my gallery is quite big, but there are a couple of weeks in the sort of next eight weeks where I don't have a forward playing or I don't have a goalkeeper playing in super rare. So then it's like, does it even make sense me approaching this now? Because you have to be able to field at least four really competitive lineups. And because it is cap mode, you can't like plan now for like three weeks ahead. Because if they all don't hit the cap, then you, you're you're stuffed. So cap 270, as we know, I think it's definitely about your depth of your gallery. Um, we've got people in the chat saying there's a small gallery. They're not even going to be looking at putting a throwaway team in. There's no point. Um, and I totally get that. So I do think that this one more so than um, the last, you know, the last sort of all-star option that we had is more about planning ahead to an extent, just seeing if, Mostly in two in in super rare, have you got a goalkeeper? How many options do you have goalkeeper wise? Because in a couple of weeks time, if you've only got one, then it's like, do I scrape together a two forty and try and go for the threshold, or do I try and hit big here? So yeah, it is. It's really had me thinking way more than I thought it would do. Um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to hear from that vote how many of our listeners are going to be playing this how week. Many are so. going to be trying because. When you think about building a 270 team, you're so right. Like the cap moves, you need to adjust. You need to bob and weave with your depth, of course, manage the fixtures. But any 270 team that has a chance of doing something has a captain pick, has a guy that is 75, 80, 90 capable. And if you, no matter how big or small your gallery is, no matter what scarcity you're thinking about, but that player now, for a lot of people, won't be getting played in 270. Yeah. So if you're now looking at, <clears throat> I'm just using guys in my gallery as like examples, right? But you can think about whoever you want to, but uh, Wurtz, O'Reilly, Gold, Taki Kubo, Guardiol, I don't know, some of these guys that could hit big scores for their position. Would I play any of them in 270? Me personally, like I'm not going to be. And if you, no matter how big or small your gallery is, if you had like even one guy that powerful, and you weren't putting them in another division for some reason because you're trying to spread out and cover five teams rather than three or something, then yeah. uh, I think the, I think the consequences of that is going to be really interesting to watch play out, which is why we're asking in the poll for who's trying, because this one's a bit shorter as well. It's not a full month. And you know, like you can if you are going to if you are going to ship, uh, set the ship sail on this, you really should be scanning ahead the next three weeks of fixtures and seeing how many solid entries can I actually get in? Because if you do have that guy that is like a captain pick that can make the team happen, you know, because if you are going to be going for it and hitting that leaderboard and getting double scarcity payout or getting something amazing, you need that captain guy that can take advantage of that armband, you know? So, yeah. Um, but by, you know, the, the, the trap, some people will fall into it and really hurt themselves. It's like they'll finish like six for something and smash it and go, yeah, brilliant. And then like you say, Maybe then just as the game weeks unravel, you go, oh, crap, and then somebody gets suspended. And then, yeah. you know, this other game now gets postponed and then this game happens and then whatever, unforse maybe slight unforeseen, maybe some things that are somewhat on the horizon when, um, you know, yeah, del into the equation of should I go for this or not? So yeah. Wait, it's going to be a lot of interesting decision-making going on. Definitely. I think these next two weekends, this weekend might kill it completely. I think with the strength I've got and the depth I've got to select the good team that I have, which, you know, 
if you select a good team in 270, it usually plays into the detriment of other teams. And in my case, I think that looking at what I've kind of lined up as it stands, my cap 270 is looking super strong. It's rated 82 on so rare data. Um, and then if I look at, you know, like my all-star super rare is rated 69. Um, I've still managed to get an 84 into all-star rare plus for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about when you use the lineup builder in so rare data it now kind of gives your lineup a rating based on like how that team could or should be expected to perform against the average overall within that tournament and the sort of power that you're going in with all that kind of stuff so i've been using that quite a lot while i've been doing my teams of late and yeah i think one of the key points for me was that looks good, but if that looks good, I still really want to be putting strong teams into maybe a couple of rare plus divisions. And because I've got quite a few goalkeepers available this weekend, you know, I should be competing at cap 240. Uh, I have a, I had a couple of options at U23 Super Rare this week, moving into the last couple of season, uh, weeks of like Korean football. That kind of stuff is like, those sort of doubts creep in a little bit like you should really be entering this you should really be entering that and yeah I think this week I'm just like not going to think too much about that going heavy on cap 270 with a team that looks like it it should be able to really overperform the cap a lot of good fixtures for those five players a couple of players playing in the same team over in China who've got like an 89% win chance you know, like a 70% plus three goals or more chance. So I've gone for like a an attacking partnership there uh, with the cap, the captain in the forward there who usually gets among the decisives in a normal game. So if they do what they're supposed to do, you know, he is 100 capable, as is the midfielder there who kind of plays as a wide forward as well. So it's it should do well. U23 rare plus looking pretty strong for me as well. So I think this week it made sense, but it might not make sense next week. And yeah, I think my 270 rare re represents a little bit more of a like, I've not really gone for the rare as much. Super rare looked that good that I felt like I had to give it a go this week. But my rare entry is a little bit more, you know, it, there's not a lot of decisive capability in there. It's all kind of all around, which normally in 270, you want your captain to hit a decisive. If your captain can hit a decisive, you can get amongst the rewards usually. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many people kind of like fade out of the tournament in the next couple of weeks. And again, I think I'll be monitoring week to week how many entries are in there, like the night before or like the hour before. And that might even come into play, you know, like in a couple of weeks' time if I don't feel like my... Yeah, I'm high up in the sort of leaderboard. It might not be about, you know, like trying to claw back or trying to like strengthen your position in that tournament. And I think a lot of people will be like that. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this pans out. But just because it was a bit different, I like the look of the reward pool. Um, yeah. Would be interested to hear from all of you uh, how you are playing it this week. Chani, welcome to the chat. He's joined. Um, so, yeah, please do get involved if you are listening on Spotify. In that poll we're going to set um and next week we'll talk a little bit about it more i guess we'll be able to look back and see how it all panned out for people and hopefully get some some feedback as well on how everyone felt it went and how they're gonna attack it yeah. moving forward because we will have midweeks included in this as well some players are stronger some so rare players managers club owners whatever we're calling ourselves now professionals are uh <laughs> are some of them are stronger midweek you know depending on what teams you're stacking what players you're holding and stuff so you know, I think this will be an interesting one to look at the lead, especially when we look at the monthly leaderboard. Um, like maybe <clears throat> buying like this time next week, once we can see the midweek closing out, what are the top scores there like, what was the top scores at the weekend, you know, and then you know, it'll be interesting to see. And that, I want to emphasize that people who are trying, you know, you're thinking, I'm I'm making an effort, an effort of some sort, yeah. then vote yes. And if it's not, vote no, that's fine. Definitely. So what else has been going on in the world of football, Quinny? I know we've got a few bits and bobs that we kind of earmarked to talk about. There has been a lot going on in the news. Did you want to introduce to us a little bit of a, of, of I know you've picked out a few things that we were going to mention. So 
do you want to kind of like get the dice rolled on our first kind of like point of interest in the world of football this week? So last week we were talking quite a lot about the problems at Man United, the attacking issues that they've got, the players, Ten Hag, all the drama that seems to happen every two or three days. And the news we've had kind of break, I think within the last 24 hours it's been confirmed properly, but Jaden Sancho is like listed for sale. He is now on the transfer market. So that's, uh, it looks like that, uh, you know, that bridge has been burnt and Sancho and Man United will be parting ways in January. Yeah, pretty sad state of affairs. I think um, we've mentioned him on podcasts a few times as a South Londoner, a player going to Man United at, at the age that he did off the back of a great season, great few seasons actually at Dortmund, um, and also nicking him off of Man City as well. There was a lot to love about Sancho's move to Man United. So it is gutting uh, to see it end, probably end in the way that it looks like it's going to. But I don't think he'll be short of uh, potential suitors. There are some rumours online already that Dortmund might be um, in for him. And I would personally love to see him leave the Premier League. I don't know about you, Quinny, but I think that he probably needs, you know, like his face out of the kind of like the British spotlight again to maybe find his way back into the England squad um, and just go somewhere where he doesn't have that pressure that English players in general do have we've seen how well it's worked out for Jude Bellingham taking that leap over to uh, Madrid and um, yeah personally from the sort of early rumours floating about I think that a move back to Dortmund wouldn't be um, a particularly bad one for him I don't know uh, if you've got any thoughts on where you'd like to see him next or what you think he should be doing I think you I think you would do very I think Borussia Dortmund would do very well to get Jaden Sancho back like especially if they got old Dortmund Jaden Sancho back because that was you know, he was one of the hottest prospects in European football. Everyone wanted them. To, everyone wanted to sign him. Everyone thought he was going to really kick on and be like the leader for Man United, the main kind of creative, world class, up and coming talent. And I think, like we spoke about last week, I think Sancho's a guy that needs to go and prove something. And I don't know if going back to Dortmund would really scratch that itch. You know, mm. so I would. Pair, I, I don't know. I'd like to see him go somewhere different. I think the style of play he offers it could be very effective in Spain or Italy quite easily. I think France would be interesting, but I don't think there's that many clubs, you know, that you would want to see him actually go to in France and, and think that would be a good kick on for him. So I don't know. I think, you know, the, every kind of big team in Europe should be linked to him, you know, because Man United are in a selling state and they'll just want to clean off. And a lot of these clubs in Europe tend to get a pretty good deal in these situations. They don't need to pay the Premier League English tax on a lot of these players in these situations. So. Um, I think whoever thinks they can get the best bargain will probably push for it the hardest if they can get the player buy-in. Um, but if I was to push a club and, and say one, I don't know, I think Juventus are really kind of kicking back on now the way their kind of style of play has moved on. I would have thought it would have fitted quite well into maybe into maybe an AC Milan or something like that, but I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of lost on AC at the moment. But I think Juve, you know, is, is definitely a spot he could do well in uh, when you see the sort of players they've been trying to attract recently and... Italian football, I think he would drop it. Yeah, I, I could agree with that. I think Italian football, especially the way, I don't think that like in recent times we've really seen that traditional, you know, the Italian way of defending. As much as they do have like some quite, quite good quality defenders out there, I don't think that there's that many good quality defences in uh, Serie A at the minute. Um, they all managed to lead quite a lot of goals and we saw how he kind of flourished at um, Dortmund playing against the kind of teams that, were playing a little bit more open, um, trying to um, trying to sort of make use of the counter attack a little bit more, just offers him a bit more space. He's not been allowed any space at all in the Premier League, um, so yeah, a, a move to Serie A would be pretty good. Um, be interesting to see where that Juve as a club. It just makes me wonder if he personally is going to be pushing more towards clubs who have. Champions League football this season to see if he can squeeze his way into the Euros. Um, it, you know, he's he's got a massive uh, hill to climb if he is to find his way into that um, squad. But I imagine that he, if he really like rates himself, will see a way into that squad. And therefore, I think he needs to be playing Champions League football um, this year. So I think that's like potentially the only thing that maybe stops a, a Juve move for him at the moment. But how about this? Come Would you take him at Newcastle? 
Oh, I mean, let's have a look. Who have Newcastle got in those positions at the minute? They've got Almiron and Gordon. Gordon's been brilliant on the left. Yeah, I wouldn't touch him. Good. He's he's been brilliant, but maybe Sancho on the right. I don't know. Uh, the other name that kind of came to me there uh, after we were talking about Juve is: Could you imagine him playing for Napoli alongside Kravatsvilia and Osman? That would be good fun. Like, that so... would be good. Yeah. That would be good fun. I could see him in that kind of team, but their managerial situation at the moment is kind of all over the place. So I don't know if that's a great situation to move into, but they're playing Champions League football, obviously current Scudetto champions. Yeah. And they, they could use an injection of quality like that into their team, you know, to get their season really as champions, as reigning champions, you know, kind of up and going. So yeah, Napoli would probably be a lot more fun than Juve, but I think Juve could probably make it happen financially because reportedly he's on a quarter of a million quid a week. So yeah. Is it a buy? Is it a loan to buy? Is it, you know, I, I think this is going to be a bit Jao Felixy. The yeah. way that has been over the last, like, remember he went loan to Chelsea, then the Bars, you know, and everything else that's going to happen with him. So it might be a wee bit of a golden handcuff situation there with that wage packet he's on. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I can't see anyone picking up the wage bill. I think he will probably go out on loan till the end of the season with a view to buy based on performance and... Yeah, but I, I'm fully expecting Man United to have to probably continue to pick up like 50 to 70% of his wage. Um, if he's to go anywhere where he's going to get the game time and stuff like that, particularly. Yeah, I mean, there's some chat in here, people saying that he looks like, it feels like a turkey. I don't think, I don't, I think turkey might be a bit that the too far. I don't think that they're going to yeah. have, you know, the clubs that you think of, obviously, like, I don't think Galatasaray have space for him in their squad. They've got enough forwards there. And that only really leaves like Fenerbahce. I can't see him there. I don't think they're going to pick up the wages. Um, yeah, I think Turkey might be a bit too far. You know, maybe a PSG. Oh, but they don't need him either, really. They're, they don't they're need options. Them. They don't need him. I'm really selling myself on this Napoli scenario now. In my I, love that. <laughs> I think that would be a great like a good one. That would be great. I'd love. I'd, I'd pe for him personally. I think that'd be a fantastic move. I'd, yeah, like you said, that you know that three pronged attack, Oshman, Kvaratskhelia, um, you know Raspadori there as well. They've got some exciting players up top. He could definitely um, spread his wings a bit there. I think he'd be offered a bit more freedom um, in that Napoli team, especially playing in front of like an overlapping Di Lorenzo. He would be a good watch there. I'd love to see that. Love to see that. Yeah, if anyone from Napoli is listening, get on the phone to his agent a bit a bit sharpish. We all want to see it happen. And as someone who owns his card on it, so rare, I'd love to see that happen as well. That'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> nice. nice. Another thing that was, uh, we kind of touched on Newcastle there. Somebody's saying Eddie Howe wouldn't touch him and fair enough, right? But they, they kind of, they, I, I, I don't know if it really affects us too much, right? But one of the main headlines that's going around at the moment is Sandro Tonali and Nicola Zaniolo has been kind of moved to the side of this and then Fagioli is very much in the middle of it. Uh, so, but, you know, it looks like Sandro Tonali is going to be facing some sort of worldwide ban from football for like a year is what's reported at the moment. He's admitted to betting on AC Milan matches when he was not involved, like maybe suspended or injured or something. Um, and yeah, what do we think about, does this derail Newcastle really heavily? Is this a, uh, the, you know the bump in the road that takes the tire off the off the car i think it is one of those things that i think will be okay in the short term but as the season kicks on if newcastle manage to you know excel they've had a great start in the champions league they're going to need all those players in their squad and i think that tonali's been a really important catalyst for a lot of the good that's come in the, in the early part of this season he is a really important cog in the wheel there and they're going to have to try and replace him. I think if he is going to um, miss at least the rest of this season. So yeah, I mean, Newcastle will be gutted and there will be questions asked of um, the scouts and, you know, the directors of football. How was this not known about? Did AC Milan know about this? They've obviously already come out and said they didn't. But there's going to be a lot to uh, unravel in this case. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if more players get sucked into it as well, because the way it kind of came about, wasn't it, was uh, I think the initial investigation 
was into one of the other players. And then Tonali didn't even get dragged into it until like telephone messages kind of got dragged up. And then they realised that he was almost like the ringleader of this. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is going to be a mess. And I think that it is a circus that Newcastle could do without as they've started the season so well they'll be really disappointed that they are dealing with this now and not just focusing on football. Um, but yeah, I, they will almost certainly be in the market in January. I mean, they'll probably be, they'll probably be like making calls now almost uh, to make sure that they can get these players in. Because I do think that, yeah, in the mid to long term, that's when we'll really start to feel the effect of Tonali not being there because he is such an important player in that midfield. And yeah, He's one of the main engines, isn't he? So yeah, there go. I think it's. I, I think it just screams that AC Milan knew this was coming because we spoke about it on the podcast. I've made videos about it on the channel that I thought Tenali for fifty-four million or whatever was a great bargain. It felt like the first bid. They just accepted the first facts that came in. They're like, that, right, take that money, send them out now. <laughs> you yeah. know, he was like whisked over in a plane. You know, everyone will remember it. He looked pure sad. He's like, I can't believe I'm here. That was a bit of a meme and might have been taken out of context some of that, but. It does feel like AC maybe knew what was coming down the pipe and took their money while they could. Yeah. Um, but Tenali's been hugely important for, for Newcastle, I agree. I think he's been a huge part of like what's helped them lift their level this year. A huge part of what's helped them get four points in the Champions League so far. But guys like Longstaff and Elliot Anderson have really stepped up this year. You know, Newcastle have had a great run of like five victories or something like that before the draw with West Ham uh, in all competitions in those guys have been huge parts of playing in midfield with Joe Linton been out as well. So, I, you know, I do think they've still got the standard in the squad to kind of maintain top six, top seven in the cha in, in, in the league. And when I did the prediction for the Group F, I, I had Newcastle finishing third. I thought they would get, you know, maybe like six or seven points at home and maybe a couple of points away and get third uh, the way it would shake out. Maybe they'll still do that as well. But as the season drags on, it will get painful. You know, because some of these guys will get five yellow cards. Some of these guys will themselves become injured uh, at different stages. And, uh, you know, Tenali was a huge, like, part of what should be the, the this season, who's available, the qualities and strengths that the squad has, etc. So if he's out for a year, do you full-on replace him? Or do you just kind of carry on with the plan as is? What do you think the move is in January? Yeah, I'm I'm sitting here thinking about it now. People in the chat saying that Danny Chabalos uh, on loan in January has been linked already. Um, and I think the difficult thing is how, like, if there is like a like for like player out there available on the market, and you using our kind of like so rare knowledge of you know like the scoring matrix, the kind of players that score similarly is a good way to kind of like, all right, even if you haven't had a proper look at a player. The sort of, you know, Tonali is that kind of like deep line midfielder. We spoke a bit about, you know, Frankie de Jong. He's that kind of player, isn't he? He's quite deep lying, but he does have that dynamism. He does get forward a little bit more than, you know, like a real deep sitting midfielder. And in my head, I can't get past, uh, and I'm pretty sure Newcastle will link to him as well, but he's now unavailable. He's moved to Nottingham Forest, but uh, Sangare, you know, like is a player that might have been able to fit that void for them, who's now not available. Um, and it does make you wonder, doesn't it, that, you know, players like Joey Veerman getting looked at, he is exactly the kind of player that could kind of fit into that position. And if PSV carry on the way that they are, but then obviously um, does that create a situation with, you know, cup, cup tied? Um, I, I can't remember the ins and outs of the rules, um, whether or not um, players who've played in the group stages. The rules are all very transfer friendly nowadays to make I, sure I that, you know, that, I think, but if you still, I think because he's played Champions League, I don't think you could play him there. But I think if you went to Europa League or, you know, yeah. these kind of things happen, then it's all cool. It's all cool. But they've made the rules as transfer friendly as they possibly can nowadays for that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you think they would, they would go into midfield and, and probably strengthen further then? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, there's a great shout in uh, the chat again. SR Dimebar saying Calvin Phillips makes a lot of sense short term. And I think that is a good shout. He, yeah. you know, and he will want minutes as well. Like, can he squeeze himself into that Euros um, squad doing that 
in a team that has Champions League football and is, you know, up and amongst the uh, top performers in the Premier League, Calvin Phillips would be a fantastic shout. And it would be a great move for him as much as it would, not just for Newcastle, but for Man City. Because if he could, you know, put some put some use to him a little bit more than they're able to, you know, put him back in the shop window. Because I don't think that he has a long-term future at Man City, the way things are looking and who they've got coming up through the ranks and who's kind of being selected in those positions. I can't see Calvin Phillips getting minutes in the next couple of seasons at City, really. So it probably makes sense for them to move him on. And they need him to get minutes elsewhere to like remind people that he is a good player and he can play. Um, I do think that he will probably find his way into the England setup anyway, because we've seen the way that Southgate kind of selects his squads for the knockout games, for the uh, qualifiers. I don't think that he will lose his place in the team if he stayed at City, but I think that like he might be able to force himself back into the starting eleven a little bit more if he did get a move to a team like Newcastle. So I think Phillips is a great shout. Um, I think so too, because, you know, Sandro Tonali has been long touted as the next Andre Pirlo, but Calvin Phillips is currently touted as the Yorkshire Pirlo. So, <laughs> you know, he needs the minutes, like you say. I think Eddie Howe would really welcome him into the changing room as well, because he'll be bringing all the pepisms with him, mm. you know. So you'll be like, right, what do we do here, Calvin? <laughs> what does Pep do? What would Pep say? You know, you can get a wee bit of intel out of him, you know, maybe. Uh, advance in some ways <laughs> in that sense so yeah. I think that, that that I think that makes a lot of sense you know you've got the next Pirlo out so get the Yorkshire Pirlo uh, and, and plug him in and yeah you could do a lot because Tanali like you say Calvin Phillips is probably more defensive you maybe get you maybe get that more of a Rodri presence out of a Calvin mm. Phillips because Tanali isn't that deep line Bruno Gomares isn't that deep line they want to affect the game they want to get into the final third and you know impose themselves on the match a bit more so even Calvin Phillips coming in on loan to fill that Tenali void, you maybe get a bit more out of Bruno all of a sudden. When Joe Linton comes back, you can get more out of him all of a sudden. Elliot Anderson, yeah. when you play him, the same thing, you know. So, yeah, that feels like a deal that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, FFP-wise, you know, because Tenali was 54 million, which for Newcastle is, is a heavy FFP burden on their books mm-hmm. for a couple of seasons until the cycles move up and their revenue increases, etc. So... That feels like a that feels like a deal that just ticks like every box on the sheet. I think we've solved it. <laughs> yeah. So so far we've sent Sancho to Napoli. <laughs> Who's next on the agenda? <laughs> the other main question I had coming out of this international break is he trying to like preview into the football coming back, the real stuff. The thing that just slaps you across the face is Tottenham are top of the league, right? Which after selling Harry Kane, I know Madison coming in was. Madison's a big deal. Madison's a big transfer. That was a coup, right? There's no getting around that, right? But outside of that, they've not done... They've sold Kane. They've not mm. done any business for my money, if you get me, um, in that regard. So they're sitting top of the league. They don't have European football to think about. Um, and I've seen an amazing graphic today uh, from Opta that shows that Man City are 75% likely to go on to win the league. At this stage, right, is it still a foregone conclusion? Are Man City still going to go and win the league? Or between... Any team you want to think about, could anyone cause an upset this year? It's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think that City come with the experience that a lot of the teams up and amongst it now, or expected to be amongst it, like come the end of the season, City have got experience now. They've got a lot of players who've gone through that latter stage of, you know, league season, but they did it last season in such a fashion that they were still firing on all fronts, whereas other teams faltered um at the final hurdle when you know they only really had like one fixture a week to worry about so i think that's probably why they're heavily weighted as um the favorites for the title i think in terms of squad depth and quality as well i think they're almost the league above pretty much everyone in the premier league still um but with that said the the unknown quantity is Ange, isn't he? and you um probably know that more than most and a lot of you know, you, you spoke very highly of him before he landed at Tottenham Hotspur. He's obviously become a little bit of a cult hero already, not just at Tottenham, but, you know, you see all of the sort of football uh, online content channels just regurgitating loads of clips of Ange Ange did this, Ange did this, Ange ball this, Ange ball that. And, uh, yeah, he seems to have, I I think, right, he's almost like he's got, 
as much media attention around what he's doing and the sort of positive vibe that we're getting about him from the media. He reminds me a bit of when Mourinho became like the darling. And we all know what he went on to do. I don't know how foregone a conclusion it is that Ange will win something at Tottenham, but it definitely feels like he's got the place buzzing. He's got the fans behind him. You know, the media seem to love him. No one can say a bad word about him. Um, so he's a bit of an unknown quantity. I still don't think that Tottenham can win the league. But I do think that they will they will cause issues for the teams that could potentially um, challenge for it. And I don't think there's too many in the running. I mean, Liverpool have had a good start to the season. Arsenal fans will definitely tell you that they're going to be up and amongst it this season. They've got a good vibe about their fan base. They are buzzing. Um, I'm not sure that they have enough quality, personally. I think they're lacking a couple of like world-class options. Um, especially in the forward position. I think like, I don't think Jesus is as reliable. Um, you know, he's, he suffers with injuries, doesn't he? Every season he'll get something. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sold on Eddie and Ketia um, as a, a top four striker. Um, but they do have quality elsewhere. Odegaard, obviously Saka. Um, and, uh, you know, at the back, they're looking a lot better this season. Um, they seem to have decided to side with Raya in goal. And I think that, that that looks to be working quite nicely for them as well. So I just don't think they got the depth. So City, I still think are big favourites for me, but 75% does feel a bit unfair on some of the teams. And like you said, can Tottenham continue this? What do you reckon, Quinny? Do you think Tottenham can continue? Um, can you know They're going to have a lot less fixtures to deal with than the rest of the teams around them. That's for sure. The main, the, the main issue, the main question that we need to just experience through time is the depth and can they handle us? Can you handle Madison been out for a month? Could you handle Odegaard been out for a month? Could you mm. handle your defence been injured again or you know the goalkeeper suspended for three games, something crazy happened or you know, any these number of things? But I think all those things being equal and imagining that they're not nothing catastrophic happens to anyone. I think we could be on it for like a severe title race where it goes to like the last, like we had maybe six games to go and there's like three points splitting four teams or something like that. And it could be right tight by the time we get to the back end of the season. So I'm not really even too sure because I think that's the way we're going to get to, you know, by the time, I don't know, five or six games left to go. Basically, I find it quite hard to think about who will go and actually win the league because I think there's, I think there's just going to be so much competition that, I say once we get to the last five or six games, I think there'll be so much to play for that yeah. you may be surprised at who's actually in the running, you know. It's a good shout that. And I think, you know, if we were talking about this as little as maybe um, four to six weeks ago, I don't think either you or I would have expected City to drop the points that they have in that time either. So, yeah. you know, and that's early in the season, you know, when the fixture calendar isn't as busy they haven't lost many players to injury. So we've seen them drop points already um, before the pressure's really been on. So who knows? I'd, I'd love to see that kind of running. I think the Premier League's missed that a little bit. Um, even, you know, it, it didn't finish particularly early last season, did it? But it felt done for a long time. As much as we had to wait, it just felt inevitable. No one could see City dropping points and they just didn't for so long. But um, think, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, I think Liverpool are really slept on in this whole conversation as well because Liverpool have had a great start to this season and they're playing Europa League and they are rotating for fun. Like They are taking it really easy uh, in terms of on their workload for their squad. Done really good business overall in the market. They've built a new midfield, which you know Klopp got a lot of slack for not doing. But you know since obviously Henderson and Fabinho have got them some Saudi transfer fees in the door, they've went out and... You know, so they bought a whole new midfield. And it feels like last season they bought a whole new attack. Guys like Diaz and Nunes and Gakpo. Mm. So, and there's been that little bit of periodic work on the defence, you know, with who is going to partner Van Dijk and a wee bit of backup options and whatever. So I think Liverpool, like, if you really do look at them and you think, imagine this team does blend together because we've not really seen, and I've not watched, I've watched Liverpool maybe three or four times this year, so I've not watched everything they've done, right? But we've not really seen, when we do start to see, is probably the best way of putting this, 
Gravenberg's McAllister and Sobisly gelled and operate in that, that kind of peak Jurgen Klopp level that he will mm. probably knock them into. I think one of the big conversations Liverpool fans will have is imagine this midfield with Sadio Mane and uh, Firmino, if you know what I mean. I think that's the kind of, I think that's the potential that Liverpool have got kind of cooking now, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. And if you look at their form this season, they're pretty impeccable. And like I say, once we get to the last five or six games, you might be really surprised at who's actually in the reckoning for this league because there's more than two or three teams that have spent a lot of money and got a lot of world-class players. That's true. That's true. I've been really impressed with Sabozla, actually. I think he's come he's come and hit the ground running, hasn't he? We all saw how good he was um, in Germany and like all the things that he's done up to this point. But he has translated his form straight into the Premier League. Um, and Liverpool fans love him. And rightly so, I think he's a great player. Good addition to the squad. And yeah, I think they are a bit of a sleeper, aren't they? Like It's hard for me to admit that. But yeah, they will probably be... For me, they'll be top two. I I think City and Liverpool are probably the main contenders for the title from what I've seen so far. Spurs fans will be guided to hear that, but it's still a little bit, it feels a bit too soon as well for me. Just I do think Tottenham will, will be top four, but I can't see them in the top two, not just yet. Maybe soon, but uh, yeah, Liverpool will be there or thereabouts. And um, yeah, like you said, I think... They've got exciting players on the come up as well. Obviously, we've seen Harvey Elliott kind of like filtered in the last few seasons. <laughs> but one of the Jones. players, yeah, I really wanted to talk to you to touch on this player, Ben Doak, who's been brought in this season, who a lot of Scottish football fans are absolutely buzzing about. Have you seen much of him? What can we expect from him? Is he gonna are we gonna see him play a big part this season at Liverpool? Well, the expectation is he's gonna get some Europa League minutes and that kind of thing this year is kind of Mo Salah's shadow, which is very promising, you know. Uh, I think the recent comparison I heard is people calling him the Scottish Rooney, just because of how, like, uh, just because of his build and how young he's kind of debuting and making his way in the game kind of thing. But he came through when Ange was at Celtic. Ange debuted him. Ange played him maybe three or four times, maybe one start, a couple of times from the bench, when he'd, like, just turned 16. And that wasn't enough to keep him. Liverpool signed him, and we mm -hmm. couldn't keep a hold of him. And... He was there last year playing like B team, elite youth level stuff. And then that's also now this year he's I say he's in as the shadow. So he's got his first cards on Soria at the moment. So we're all quite excited for that. Because he debuted for Celtic, they're not rookie cards. So yeah. he is a Celtic rookie by all accounts, a Celtic youth prospect in that regard. So yeah, uh, yeah. Everyone's really excited for him. The national team needs a bit of magic up front. And if he can give us a bit of that, then let's let's go get it. So I've not really seen him much beyond like little highlight clips that people put out on social media. And, you know, if I've been watching a Liverpool game and he's came on, obviously. Um, but yeah, so he's one to watch out for this year as well as like Elliot's and Jones's. There's a really good, like, that's what I mean when I say they're slept on. And that sense, like Liverpool, like for all the things that City are held out is having a really good, like consistent manager, style of play, level of depth, da, 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 da. Liverpool are still figuring some stuff out and some players are still like getting into their finest self. But Liverpool have really got a lot of that stuff knuckled down. They're a really well-oiled club, you know, by a lot of metrics. And yeah, I think like even some of these worst case scenarios that could unfold, like they've got so many players. I think they'll be pretty tidy for it as well. And I think Liverpool, yeah, we'll probably start hearing, you know, we're hearing a lot of stuff in the chat here as well. They need wins rather than draws. And that's definitely mm. some sort of criticism you could have on them early season. But their fixture schedule early season has been formidable as well. So to come through undefeated, I think, is a big slept on kind of part of all this, Dishy Boy. But um, one thing I did want to ask you, right, coming back to Soraya and coming back to cards and all that kind of stuff, right, is I had a little bit of a dilemma, right, where, see, for two of my teams, like, let's say team number two and team number three, if I played them the way I wanted to play them, which was some, like, what I'd say is completely optimal, right? Both teams, half of them play Saturday, half of them play Sunday, right? Now, for probably the most interchangeable time ever by swapping two players around like they are very much similar like same cap score same kind of profile of game and how mm. many points i expect them to get and i could just swap two of them around and it would make me have a full team on saturday and a full team on sunday players in different games <laughs> what would you do i stop optimal and do the I, games on the days or would you go optimal do you know what i think i totally get this question 
because it's not when I'm building my lineups, I never really look. The only time I ever really look at what data fixtures on are when it, it um, it's down to like K League because we know how long it can take those scores to come through. And it's like, do I want to be sweating for three days wondering if that player is going to get his AA added in time? So that's the only time I really look at like what day the fixture is. But I also completely can uh, relate to that feeling. It's so nice when all your teams play, all your players play in one team on one day or even within a couple of hours. It's like, sweet, that score is locked in. It can either sit there and just like hold or like, you know, slowly get chipped away by some other players. But it, that is actually a really nice feeling to have. And it definitely like, I think if you're someone who suffers with anxiety, that is the way to go. Just bang a team on Sunday, Saturday. I think we had Nanzo on, didn't we, talking? Or No, it wasn't Nanzo, actually. It was Tom C at that Liverpool game that we, we took part in. We spoke to him for a little bit after the game, and he was saying that he purposely puts players in his teams who have like one of those random little like Monday night, Tuesday morning fixtures so that he yeah. can creep his way into the rewards when everyone thinks he's dead. Uh, so Tom C is like the grim reaper in that respect that like he just he'll just turn up behind your lineup like when you least expect it oh thought he was done zombie entry he's here to kill you mate he's here to take you out with a minute left of the game week uh, before the window closes but um, yeah personally I love to be able to avoid that so how would I play it I think I think if I had the luxury of doing that, I'd be very tempted to split them into Saturday and Sunday. If the if it didn't make too much difference in terms of fixture weight, cap scores, all that, whatever it is, I think. But if it was, if it was for something like a special weekly where I really wanted to win the reward that was on, you know, that was there to be won. In that case, I would not. I would, that I'd never look at like when the fixture is. But if we're talking like all star, all star rare pro, and it's like yeah, I've got a couple of similar like super rares or whatever that the the lineups are almost the same, but the fixtures are on different days. Then maybe yeah, maybe I'd go for that. What what are you? What's your thinking at the minute? Which way are you going? I've went with. I've I've ended up landing on just doing the optimal thing because I do actually want to win, and there is like there is a little difference, and I'm like I'll just stick with the I'll just do the best people with the best team kind of thing. Yeah, uh, is what I went for. But you know, I was looking at it, and I was like, yeah, that could be really good because then on Saturday, like you say, it's that whole completion thing where you know Saturday it's about two forty today. Everything's about cap two forty. Get to two eighty points. Yeah, smash yeah. it, smash it, smash it, and then you can get up Sunday, and then it's like. All star, brilliant. Here we go, guys. Smash it, smash it, smash it. Let's go for all star. And it gives your kind of like your viewing day a bit more. I do it anyway. Everyone does when you're following your scores and your teams. You just follow the teams and the scores on the leaderboard as they kind of arrive to you. But like you say, when you have you're, you're watching a game on Saturday, big scores come in, and you're like, brilliant. And then it's like, right, okay, one guy plays at eight o'clock Sunday and then oh. five o'clock Monday. And it's like, cool, right, need to wait to really celebrate. It's like VAR, kind of. You're kind of celebrating the guy scoring the hat-trick, but then you're like, oh, I can't really celebrate yet because I need to wait for five other things to happen, you know. I think I should so. probably start looking at this because one of the things that's been happening to me a lot of late is having four players hit really nice and then the last one, out of no fault of my own because I haven't really checked when the fixtures land, it'll be a player, it'll be the one player in the lineup who was like, uh, oh, if he plays, if he starts... And you're like, oh, you're just sweating all day. Just I need to see that starting lineup and just see he's in there. And then, you know, anything is possible. But when the time I'm putting those lineups together, I'll know I'll put them in knowing that there's a chance it might be a, an appearance from the bench. That's not always so bad if it's like a forward, because it's like he comes on maybe get an assist or a goal, like it's very likely. Like in in, in my case this week, that's Brian Cherky, who if anyone saw under 21s absolutely tore it up. I know he was playing against Cyprus under 21s, but still he was involved in everything. His highlight reel from that game views like uh, players like career long highlight, highlight reels. Um, streets will never forget compilations, all of that. He is a streets won't forget player, but this performance was out of this world. And he is going into the game week at Leon fully expecting him to sit on the bench for most of the game. Um, but, you know, coming back from a performance like that, do you think that plays into the manager's head a little bit? 
like if he doesn't start him, like he absolutely tore it up. He's been all over the French news. Every club that was linked to him in the summer is posting these videos. All of the fans of Chelsea particularly have been reposting this video, like why didn't we sign him, blah, blah, blah. And he must be riding very high on confidence. It would be the ideal time to give him a start this weekend against Clermont. At the moment, I've got him in like very punty lineups, but I would, if I thought he was going to start, he'd be straight in one of my main lineups. And that is the pain that I um, expel on myself most weekends, putting a player like that in the team that is going to have four players play Friday night, smash it, and they've got to wait all the way till like Sunday night till a player like Turkey has to at least start the game. Um, but yeah, I think Leon need a, they need a result. And if you're going to, bench a player off the back of a performance like that, I just, I'd question what the manager's thinking. And yeah, I'd, I'd be interesting to see what happens to him this weekend, but he is definitely that player for me this week. And I'd love to put him in a priority lineup. I think if I knew he was going to start, he'd be sh probably my best forward option this weekend, but just fancy him to continue that absolutely ripping it up against Claremont. But it probably won't be the case. Um, in terms of this game week, I imagine you, Quinny, are going to be using uh, the heavy hitters from your Celtic selections to try and win yourself some of those sexy 3D Celtic cards. Uh, who's in the prize pool that you're really after? What is the card that you most want to win? <laughs> well, this is a funny thing, Stish, right? I'll need to check it closer to the deadline, right? I've not checked it today. But as of up to, like, last night, uh, you got a challenger. Top, I'm looking at super rares, right? Go to Challenger. This will be probably kind of similar at rare, but you'll maybe have some extra players because there's obviously more rare cards dished out than there is supers. But there's only one tier one given out, and that's for number one, okay? There is no Celtic card in that. Matt O'Reilly must count as a star, and right. I'm not too sure where McGregor reckons, but he's not in the pool, so fine. So all the Celtic cards, like all of them, are in the tier two pool. So... I'm entering Challenger, and I actually don't want to finish top. I want to finish, <laughs> I want to finish second. That's exactly what I want to do, is finish second, but pull the best Celtic card possible. So the Celtic cards aren't actually that high on the pool, so I actually probably want to finish like fifth. So mm. that's that's the strategy this week, is finish fifth and Challenger. Fourth, fourth or fifth, I, I could deal with. Well, as we mentioned earlier on the podcast, you say that like McBride has been sweeping up all of the... Uh the Celtic card. So with that 5% bonus, you know, he, he, I very often see him and, and you very close to each other on, on the leaderboards. It tends to be the case that, you know, like a captain pick one way or a super rare pick versus a rare pick can sometimes be the difference between the two of you. Do you ever discuss with McBride and other Celtic collectors who you put in where? Is there any kind of like code there as like a, a major collector of a club like Celtic? I would definitely say, like, me and McBride are in a chat, so, like, so he's got O'Reilly unique and Kyogo unique. He used to have Taylor, doesn't anymore. So, he, you know, we just, we discuss our big teams anyway, you know, in terms of just like, oh, I'm excited for, you know, this, or, or, or I'll be really excited for his O'Reilly, because that O'Reilly, mate, I said it, I can't remember where, but see when I seen the 3D super rare O'Reilly on auction, I was like, that is going to make his unique look crazy cheap he paid like under maybe been it's around four if you paid i think okay. for the superior uh, for the unique o'reilly i forget the exact number i may be a little bit out but it's not that far away and the super went for about two anyway the other day so uh so anyway yeah it's kind of like where's it you know where am i putting mcgregor where's he putting o'reilly it's kind of just it's not as if it's disgusted or anything like that but he'll put and uh i'll see he's putting it in all-star and i'll be like oh i'm an all-star i'm always an all-star so it's me just kind of waiting to see <laughs> more is he putting in Kyogo or is he putting in O'Reilly? That it's more me waiting to see what he's doing, to be quite frank. Um uh, but this week I'm going challenger, so maybe need to see what, what or, uh, I maybe need to watch out. But the thing with McBride in particular, with me, is he's getting more uniques. So he's got the ability to maybe go up a gear right, and yeah. play those Celtic U's into into the level above a little bit. So um interesting. So I don't know if that, I, I don't know if that, how it goes for other people that have like those kind of blue a lot of those blues are even uh, high XP rated kind of reds. If they even like, it's not even as if like where are you where are you going or whatever. But uh, uh, I definitely am looking to see 
Like if he puts O'Reilly in All-Star, I'm always like, oh God, he's going to beat me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if he puts Kyogo in, then I'm like, okay, I've got a chance. Um, so That's interesting. I guess that this must be a thing that anyone that plays like stacks of clubs, they you probably become aware of other players that play the same team. So like at limited level, obviously we met a few of the Villa boys who like stacked the Villa cards last season. And there's definitely a few of them, right? And I know that this season I've seen a few game weeks where the top five teams are all like all Newcastle. or So there's, I think every team has like four or five players that stack. But I guess once you get to like super rare, rare, and especially unique, if you're stacking players in those all-star super rares and challenger super rares, you're probably only playing against one, maybe two other players who have the similar strategy to you, just slightly different cards. So that's really interesting. I think that like you and McBride are potentially like one of the, uh, especially within the kind of content uh, creators like realm, are two of the most sort of like visible, you know, we know you know each other. You've got similar lineups, but just different scarcities and stuff like that in sometimes the same division. I wonder if there's other teams and other like uh, countries maybe where there's like the Napoli boys who have the similar uh situation to yourself but uh yeah we'd love to hear a little bit more if you are a stack player it'd be lovely to hear the stories of you uh you know like who's your arch nemesis within that kind of like that, <laughs> yeah who that else does your next p who's got you on the five yeah. percent pump you're on four percent you can't quite get there the ball has exactly got you that. exactly that there's got to be a few rivalries out there within the world of so rare who you know the little arch nemesis within the stacking uh situation but yeah, that's that's funny. It's definitely a unique uh, experience. That's something that I haven't really experienced as someone who hasn't stacked. But on the opposite end of that, one thing I did want to say to you was I look at some of my lineups for the weekend, right, at least as they are now. And I think that like as much as my current all-star rare plus lineup looks on paper to be really strong, it is what I would call an absolutely ugly lineup in that there is no two players from the same team. Um, there's a lot of different fixtures, some are home, some are away. Uh, you know, some, some have a big chance of, uh, of winning. Some don't, I'm going to read this lineup out to you. I think this might possibly be the least, um, aesthetic, so rare lineup I've ever put into, um, an all-star rare plus entry as it stands. I have Rafael Romo in goal, rare Gustavo Velazquez of Newell's old boys at, uh, as a captain at the back. Joey Veerman, super rare. We all know about Joey. Fabio Barini, rare, who plays at Sampdoria in the, the second division of Italian football. And then um, Sukasa Shiatani, super rare. Um, Sam Fresche, Hiroshima, uh, centre-back. On paper, great team. Every fixture is double or triple A. Um, a lot of good XP. Fabio Brini on a 12.5%. Velasquez on 11. Um, and Veerman on 32. And Shiatani on 31. So in terms of power, really powerful lineup. All the fixtures looking good. Everyone's, you know, like averaging around 60 or better, apart from Barini, who's currently on a 51. But big fixture for him at home. How ugly is that lineup? And does do you ever look at lineups and just think, I don't like the fact that there isn't anything that matches up there you know in a time when like stacking is at least if you sort of stack half the team maybe defense and attack that for me is like i've got five fixtures i need to worry about there um you know in coming back from international break some of the players i don't like looking at that lineup but on paper it looks like it should do really well and I've sim of a similar one on in Rare Plus U23 as well. But do you ever look at your lineups and just think, I hate the fact that nothing matches up there. There's nothing. There's no synergy. It's nice to have a bit of synergy in the lineup. Synergy, I don't really care for too much, to be honest with you. But I do know that feeling of you look at the team and you're just like, that's just not, I don't know. So when you when you first said that, that was the kind of feeling I thought it was going to be because it's like I spent about three days looking at so many combinations of my lineups and I was just like this isn't it this isn't mm -hmm. it this isn't it you know and it's uh, it's, it's almost like trying to it's like a jigsaw puzzle we spoke about this a number of times as well you know but it's like trying to put them together so that they're as strong as possible um to win the main things you're trying to win 
Mm. And yeah, I, I kind of had that feeling this week, uh, certainly. But I see in terms of the synergy part, I actually kind of, if it is all like, if it is a full Celtic team, I always feel like, oh, that's a mistake. That can't be right. That can't be the best team. Surely I can find somebody better to replace one of them. Who's better that could replace somebody in this team? So I'm kind of actively on the other end of the scale from that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've definitely got some better looking teams that are still five feet. I think this is a weird one because I look at a lot of my lineups and actually nearly all of them are five separate fixtures apart from a couple of teams, in particular my Asia Rare Plus is just Orsan and Saul this weekend. Um, and I put them all in and I decided to go into Champ Asia Rare Pro or Rare Plus. But... um. My champ Euro rare is looking good this weekend. I've got Ter Stegen in goal, Pavard, Cruz, Mbappe, and Grimaldo. Like that. That's a so rare banger, that one, for me. Um, the only worry there is, does Pavard start? Like, I think Cruz starts this week off the back of the international break. He tends to because he doesn't play international anymore. Yeah. But, um, I like the look of that. And that is still, you know, that's five fixtures. Not all of the players are 100% nailed on. I think that's where that issue arises. But I always feel good about my lineups for the weekend. And I'm definitely feeling good about most of them. But I just don't know what it is about that one. Something just doesn't look right to me. I can't look at it and be like, that's going to bang. Even though all the fixtures tell me it should. It's really weird. I've never looked at a lineup like that. That looks that strong. That also at the same time doesn't feel quite right. And I can't put my finger on what it is. <laughs> I don't know. It feels what... like Veerman. Veerman just feels like, you know, the, the crown jewel and amongst yeah. a bunch of bargain basements, you know. It might, yeah, it probably is that. I just, it's weird. Like, where, where would I put him instead? Like, I could go into All Star Super Air heavy, but then, I don't know. I don't know, Quinny. That could definitely change between now and tomorrow. But um, as it stands, I'm going to have to get most of this done today anyway because of that early flight tomorrow morning. But, That's it. yeah, we could end up with the ugliest lineup ever to win All Star Rare Plus, and then we'll be laughing this time next week. That's the beauty That's of it. That's the beauty of it. Have we got any other uh, uh, any other ground to cover before we wrap things up, Quinny? We've had a we've had a we've done some extra time this week, up to the hour and a half mark almost. So, uh, I mean. Yeah, it's been been a pleasure as always, mate. Always a pleasure, mate. Never a chore. Is she... <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few catchphrases in there now, mate. <laughs> yeah, we call that catchphrase. Fair enough. <laughs> we definitely stole them that from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That's it's it. definitely not original content. That so. no <laughs> plagiarism. Um, that's it. But uh, yeah, it should be a huge weekend, I think, because yeah, like I say, it's the first weekend of Super Cap coming out of an international break and. But in that kind of main furlong, we've kind of now got all the cards. Turkey get 3D this week as well. We've seen some like American cards come out for this season that are not 3D. We don't really speak about that. Um, but yeah, the prize pool should be packing, you know. So, you know, fight your fight this week. That's the that's the way to get the end product. Find the first team you can build. Let's get five guys that are going to do the absolute best. Work out the best place to put it, and then build the rest of the teams. And let's go get some. Once again, thanks everyone for your eyes and ears and we will see you again this time next week. Good luck everyone and have a good game week.